This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Go to our website at wdtatpodcast.com and click on support to learn how you can be part of this effort to learn how to have better conversations, increase compassion, and build bridges, not walls. You can make a one-time donation or become a patron for as little as $1 a month and receive patron-only benefits. Thanks to all of our patrons at any level for your support. We really couldn't do this without you. Now let's get into the interview. In this episode, I talked to Mark Van Steenwick about his subversive children's literature, how to talk to kids about hard things, squirrels preaching about capitalism, and how St. Nicholas would beat Santa Claus in a fight. Uh, This is part two of our conversation, so if you haven't listened to part one, make sure to go back and listen to episode 46. Or don't. It's your life. Now, let's get into it. Welcome to the podcast where we talk about things we're not supposed to, learn how to have difficult conversations, and talk to people about what makes them different. This is the We Don't Talk About That with Lucas Land podcast where we do talk about that with me, Lucas Land. It's never the right place or time. It's imperceptible to the eye. Anybody who has too much power, who's not able to handle it, will do bad things. I want him to not have any of that power or wealth anymore, so he has a chance to live a good life. Yeah, like that's what yeah. <laughs> I'll tell him that, and I think maybe it sticks. I'm hoping. Yeah, yeah. That's to me, the goal for a while, and then and then they come back at when something else happens, and be like, ah, forget it. Like <laughs> we just need to <laughs> we just need to take him out. Yeah, because that's <laughs> yeah. what that's what my kids are. I'm, I'm sure they listen somewhat and. I, I think I repeat it enough, you know, and try to like listen to them and, and say, yeah, that, you know, but you need to, you know, slow your roll a little bit there with the, <laughs> yeah. the, uh, retribution and the vengeance. But it um, doesn't alarm me. Like I, if he says the same things in front of his grandmother, mm. it's like, it's, it's like a little low level emergency to her, I think. But right. for me, it's like, I get it. Right. I know exactly why you feel that way. And part of me feels that way too. But yeah, I'm like, I'm not going to negate what they're feeling. Like it makes total sense that they'd feel that just like I right. get it. Like when like every once in a while, someone will come into the news and say, protesters were saying like, you know, like murder, like shoot the cops. Mm-hmm. And they're like, Oh my God. And they start clutching their pearls. I'm like, yeah, but it makes sense though. Doesn't it? Like that they, some protesters would feel that way. Right. Right. Like, don't negate that. Mm-hmm. Like, and the pro- because let's see, face it, the problem is not these people shooting the cops. That's not the, that's not the issue at play. And so you're doing a sleight of hand by focusing on a, a handful of people who say that. Yeah. To not focus on the fact that cops are murdering people right now. Right. Well, and I guess yeah, like the main the main thing is um, we we tend to react to things that people say, and we're so mm-hmm. I mean. We're, we're being sort of trained to be reactive by our, our social media and and yep. the way that everybody's got a hot take. And, you know, Trump yep. has really done really amped that up, too, with, you know, d- Twitter for four years being the, the norm for the president to communicate with the nation. Like like it's all it's all reactive and constantly just yes. there's no there's no moment where you get to pause and reflect about anything that's being communicated and i think what you're saying is like i mean i can some people not everybody that listens to this podcast is probably a a radical anarchist so um some of them may hear may hear some of the things you're saying and be like yeah but isn't that a problem that you know they're wanting to do violence toward cops and um you know there's not there's not a moment where we stop and and slow down and start thinking about the deeper things behind what we're talking about. And it, it can be the same with kids. Like, like if you, if you only reacted or like the grandmother it turned it into an emergency that they said they wanted to do violence to somebody, um, 
you're missing kind of like what's really going on in your kid's brain, right? And what's mm-hmm. deeper there beside the surface thing is, well, I'm I'm still, you know, I'm 12 or whatever, and um, I, I see things in a certain way because that's just, you know, the way my brain is and where I'm at in life. And this is how I can communicate what I see and what I think should should happen. It doesn't mean maybe all of these deeper things that we're because we're not willing to kind of explore and plumb like what's really going on. Oh, yeah, you you're just mad about it. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can play yeah. with it. Like we we understand that. And so like <laughs> I remember one time I think maybe he was six. It was uh uh, Chelsea Manning, I can't remember her dead name anymore, which is probably a good thing. But like when when she was getting released after being like in solitary confinement for a long time, mm-hmm. um, th- that came out or something came out where uh, with Chelsea Manning and I was talking to a friend about it and Jonas overheard and it's, it's like, well, well, what are we going to do about it? Mm. I think it's when Chelsea Manning was sentenced now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah. I'm like, well, what do you mean? What are we going to do about it? It's like, well, what? What are we going to do about it? <laughs> like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you can't just protest. I'm like, well, what do you, what would, what would you do? He's like, well, I would go to the white house dressed up as a cop. And then I would like, they think, Oh, it's a cop. And then we'd arrest them and then put someone else in power. And I'm like thinking, wow, his solution is a coup d'etat. That's wow, interesting. yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I'm like, well, what did you, what you just, what would you do with him then? Like, would you just keep him in jail for forever? He's like, no, six years. Okay. You keep, if you keep the the president in jail for six years, then at, when they come out, it's not a problem anymore. That was his solution. It's <laughs> like you imprison. I guess it was during the Obama administration. Uh-huh. You imprison the Obama administration for six years and then let him out after you've set things to right. Yeah. As a response to Chelsea Manning. Now, to me, that's I don't know how sophisticated that actually is, but it was fascinating because, like, I'm not going to get into some sort of debate about political feasibility with him. Right. In his heart, he's realizing we can't just be upset about something. We have to do something about it. And Mm -hmm. I didn't want to discourage that. Right. Yeah. Just because it didn't fit with reality. Right. Just like if he's upset about Trump and thinks, oh, someone should off him like. When I will say we shouldn't want the death of anyone, mm-hmm. but then also I'm not going to like argue with the feeling that it comes out of. Instead, I'm going to ask questions about it so he knows it's okay to feel frustrated about powerful people. Yeah, like yeah. instead of just shutting it down, which is what a lot of parents do—they just shut it down. Right, right. Well, and that yeah, exactly because it's uncomfortable for us, for a lot of parents to. Like it brings up a lot of stuff. And so having an answer that can kind of like stop the conversation or or tell them that they don't know enough or, you know, things like that um, are all these different ways that and tricks that we have Mm -hmm. for avoiding having to go down that rabbit hole. Uh, You and I, I mean, this is like I was just thinking as you were telling that story, like one reaction I was having was like, Okay, well, let me tell you about Nelson Mandela, right? Because he he was jailed for quite a while, and then he came out, and it didn't it didn't work for the regime that uh, jailed him to to keep him in jail. That did you know? But my yes, Im- yeah. my impulse to correct him by using Nelson Mandela might not have been the right one either, right? Even though it's a good story and it might teach him something, but maybe I would be like trying to show him that I know more than him rather than affirming some of the good things that he's doing, you know? No, yeah. that's, that's the tension. Like, so as I was talking about earlier about this, the co- kind of the corrective impulse, mm. like, mm-hmm. you know, in spiritual direction, uh, the whole thing is you're helping them discern. So you're not giving advice, but somehow I don't know how to, it's hard for me to think about this with my own son, but like this instinct of like, we have to do more than just protest. Mm. He understands something. And mm-hmm. I, I, I should elicit that understanding and help him like think through it and explore that rather than like give him the answers. Mm-hmm. My son got mad at me just the other day. It's like, dad, every time I'm talking to you about homework, it just, act, you act like, you know, everything, <laughs> you don't know everything. <laughs> and I, my first response was like, well, I know a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, Oh, it's just like, you just think, you know, all the answers, like you're not that smart. 
And he's just kind of upset at me. And I'm like, my instinct was like, and I'm like, why did I tell him that? And I realized that I was overdoing it because I was trying to help him feel confident mm-hmm. that I could help him, that he's not alone in this homework stuff. Yeah. But what came across was, I know more than you, so you should listen to me. Mm. And so mm-hmm. then he revealed that back to me. I'm like, good parenting is not reminding your kids that you know more than them mm-hmm. and that they should listen to you. Mm-hmm. And that if they don't listen to you, you should be upset because they're not respecting your authority. That's not my goal, even if I instinctively operate out of that. My goal is to help him tap into his own capacity and tell him that he's not alone and that I've been down this path bef- like for a while. And if he needs help, he can ask. But I don't assume that I know more than him because it's mm-hmm. his life. Like, that's hard for me. But that's the way. <laughs> yeah. That's the direction I want to go in. Right. Yeah. Well, what and what you said about uh, authority, respecting your authority made me think like um, we we assume because we have this role of parent that we've been bestowed with a certain authority. Um, but that's not really how I mean, authority that works that way, it quickly becomes authoritarian. Right. Yes. And so, um, you know, for you, I mean, what, how does that what do you how does it work uh have it, what do you think about that as as far as authority and parenting and what where does it come from and you know should we have any authority or should we how how does that relate yeah i you know i don't know for sure like <laughs> part of the shtick that like a lot of people who will describe as anarchists will like create a loophole uh-huh. and will say that we're against static authority mm rather than dynamic authority, which means that there are times and places where someone has more authority or or understanding in a situation. And I think that's kind of true, but to me that becomes a loophole. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, because at a certain point, there's a certain way in which you, it's not like children can raise themselves. Right. So there is something like authority. The problem is, is when we feel this need to secure our authority mm. and insist upon it, mm-hmm. or have that be the reason why they have to listen to you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think if a, my impression of my son is if when people tell him things out of re, respect to him mm-hmm. and they demonstrate that they have greater competence, he will automatically respect them too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They, they don't need to assert their authority. I don't think most people in relationships uh, that are healthy need to have authority asserted. So yeah. to me, the, the fact that I would have to assert my authority at all shows there's something unhealthy. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. do do I have the right to assert that as a parent? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, like there's sometimes you, I, when all else fails, you got to do that so they don't run into the street or whatever. Right. But, but that's not the goal. Mm-hmm. The goal is not to help children learn how to respect the proper authorities. Yeah, but when you're when you're like going to stop your kid from going into the street, I don't think there's any parent who's doing that and thinking to themselves. I have the authority to be doing this because I am the parent. They're thinking like I'm in charge of keeping this kid safe and mm-hmm. and they're in danger and I, I I need to protect them, right? And that's not that's not authority really. You know what I mean? Like um I yeah, I love what you're saying cuz uh, authority that is um asserted is is usually uh pretty insecure authority and probably not uh very healthy like you were saying i think that's really really helpful and man we like you and i have been talking about parenting a little before this too and and both acknowledge that like we are not <laughs> we're not the best parents uh we're not perfect parents and there's there's all these times where you know we've probably used lines that we wish we hadn't and and you know said and done a lot of things as parents but growing and learning uh-huh. and and trying to unpack listening to your kid tell you that you're being a, a know-it-all jerk <laughs> and going oh you're actually right i am being a know-it-all jerk that's so hard for uh, for parents to do but it's so good you know it's so beneficial to our parenting and our relationships with our kids well, and there's an easy way for me, like when I'm like calm and self-reflective and more at my most mature self, it's easy to tell. Mm. Mm-hmm. Am I upset at my son because he didn't listen to me? Or am I upset at my son that he's making choices that are causing him harm and that upsetness is more of a longing for him? Yeah. And the truth is when I get angry, it's because he's not listening to me. Mm. And that's like, mm. 
that's an invalid anger. Like yeah. I know where it's coming from. I need to interrogate that. And like, really, I need to shift towards being concerned. And if you're concerned, then it's about how do you develop strategies mm-hmm. to help them in a way that maintains their dignity and like supports them in their own journey. Yeah. Yeah. Rather totally. than how, like, and I've thought this way, like that, how do I get him to listen to me and do what I'm telling him? Mm-hmm. Like, that's not, <laughs> I think that way too much, but that's yeah. not the goal. <laughs> yeah. That's not a healthy goal in any relationship. Mm-hmm. So why would it somehow be a healthy goal with my kid? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I love that, Mark. And I love kind of what you're doing with um, A Wolf at the Gate. Um, it, it really reminds me, you know, talking about this and talking about what you're doing um, of, of Fred Rogers and the mm-hmm. way that he was able to take such um, seemingly like complex and difficult issues that people said at the time, like, you can't talk to kids about race. You can't you can't talk to kids about uh, the war. You know, you can't you can't bring these things up. And here he was like bringing them up masterfully, sort of boiling them down to their essence, not not like simplifying or making them um, or being Pollyanna about anything. I mean, really taking them on. But what what was brilliant about um, Mr. Rogers was the way that he boiled things down to their essence in a way that kids understood, Mm -hmm. but it also made it so much clearer for the adults about what is really going on here. You know, um, I felt like that, that is just, uh, genius. And, and so much of what, you know, like we're talking about that you can do with children's literature. Um, it, it's so, it's so meaningful for adults. It's not just for kids, you know, and I would say the same about a wolf at the gate. It's not just for kids, you know, it's children's literature, but, you know, if you're an adult and you, you know, get the audio book or, or, or read the book, um, it, it's going to bring up some challenging things that you get and, and on multiple reads too, you know, that's, what's great about it. Yeah. I've had a lot of adults read it on their own. Um, and, and they've been moved by it and I still don't know what to think about it. Some people have told me it's my best work and I'm like, it's not the most sophisticated work. So I kind of like, Oh, why don't you like my other work sometimes comes to my head, but I think there's something powerful about a story. Like mm-hmm. there's all kinds of stuff in there. It, it's kind of when I wrote it, it was geared towards where my son's age was at, which is like third grade, fourth grade. That's mm-hmm. kind of the sweet spot. I think it works for older kids. And then some people have read it to littler kids and it's, it's kind of a parental discernment thing because there is uh, there's death in it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, the thing I love about a story like that, I tried to write it in a kind of more of a classic style, a timeless style of a folklore type mm-hmm. piece. And so I think it works on that level. Like it can, it, it hits people at different levels and it has a quality of timelessness to it, which I'm, I'm proud of it at. And then the, the illustrator I worked with, Joel Hedstrom, did some amazing work. It's just vibrant, clean, uh, simple, <laughs> just start kind of artistry that I think really works well with the book. So it's, you know, it's fun. And then there's also like for, you know, anyone listening, there's also a musical children's album that I worked uh, that, uh, um, uh, that, that we worked on it. It was just a lot of fun to see like how someone else, some musicians interpreted the story and wrote songs mm-hmm, about it. Mm-hmm. Like, and those songs are even more subversive in a lot of ways than the book. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a uh, John Felton, right? And, John Felton and his soul mobile. And his, and his soul mobile. And so, yeah, I just encourage you can, people can listen to that on Spotify. If you look uh, songs from a wolf at the gate uh, by John Felton and his soul mobile, you can listen to it. Maybe you'll want to buy it, but some of those songs are like kind of cutesy kid type songs that are mm-hmm. like geared for that. But some of them are like, <laughs> talking about class struggle like so yeah. it's, it's, it gets really deep i think it's all accessible to various children but there's there's a depth there that uh you wouldn't expect from children's music or a children's um book I yeah think. 
When you also mentioned your the, your illustrator, which I I was wanting to ask you about because I love the illustrations in A Wolf at the Gate, and also that I've seen from from the Hackberry project. So, tell us a little more about um, this Hackberry project that you've got, and um, and you know what what to expect and and what you're working on there. Yeah, Hackberry is, I mean. I would say it is children's literature in a sense, the way that the Earthsea novels are like, but when you read that, like mostly it's adults that read that. Mm-hmm. I think uh, a thoughtful upper grade school level child or junior or high school student could read the Earthsea books by Ursula K. Le Guin. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's kind of where I'm aiming at. And it's, okay. yeah. but there's talking animals in it. So I, I, the reason I tell people that, like, I always do that caveat is because when people think of talking animals, they think cutesy, but it, it's not mm-hmm. a cutesy book any more than Watership Down is a cutesy book, which is the story <laughs> about uh, apocalyptic rabbits. Um, but to me, it was a question, the reason I've been writing that book and it's, <laughs> most of my energy so far has been fleshing out this world. Like I didn't, I actually feel like when I'm writing it, I'm discovering things rather than creating things. Mm. And I had to like understand the world that I was running into enough before I could start telling Hackberry's story. He's a squirrel who's living in a world that say it's set a hundred thousand years from now, humanity no longer exists. And they're in the middle of their own cat and cataclysm. And he is a figure that, um, has to deal with the potential end or beginning of the world. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's my way of reflecting upon the nature of power, uh, the nature of spirituality, uh, the nature of what good society is. I'm really like using it as a story and not in a preachy way. This is the the funnest part of it is the story is its own story. And I'm, it's my subconscious and my instincts that are coming out in the storytelling rather than me like having, Mm. Hackberry go off into a monologue about the nature of capitalism. There's none of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so that's been the fun part. It's like telling a story based upon my understanding of how reality works, exploring these deep themes that I feel like we really need to grapple with as a mm. society right now, if we mm-hmm. have any chance <laughs> yeah. at all. And particularly the younger generations really need to have an imagination for how to do life differently. If mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. if humanity is going to survive. So the book is coming from that place of urgency, but also paired with all the, all the things I love about the books. Like when I would read uh, uh, Lloyd Alexander, Ursula Le Guin, C.S. Lewis, Tolkien, all that stuff. The things mm-hmm. I loved is about people, the coming of age type story in a world of magic where anything could happen. Yeah. So that's all in there too. Yeah. Awesome. So it's just, I'm excited about it. If if mm-hmm. I can ever finish the first one, it's hopefully the first of four. And then because I've spent so much time in this world, I I could probably write more stories within the world that is being created. Yeah. So that's it's a lot of fun. Yeah. That's yeah. super exciting. You know, no nobody really needs a, a talking squirrel preaching at them about about anything, I think. <laughs> um no. Like, uh, I wouldn't listen to a squirrel <laughs> telling me about capitalism. Right. It's like you eat my <laughs> trash, squirrel, get out of here. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I, I'm curious now. I mean, maybe this is a whole other uh, topic, but you know, squirrels are squirrels are often so. I mean, I guess they are kind of often in kids' literature, but in like the adult world, they're always the like bane of every homeowner's existence, right? Like, they're well, that's where the story came from. Like one really? day, I was I was walking to the trash, and our trash can had a corner like one of those plastic city bins. You know, uh-huh. the corner was eaten like like some squirrel had eaten at at the corner to slip in and out of the trash to get food. And so (laughs) I noticed that, but I never encountered that squirrel. So Uh one day I'm going to the trash. I open the lid and a squirrel jumps out at me and scares (laughs) the crap out of me. So that night I started telling these made up stories about originally it was Gary, the squirrel. Uh But then as I started telling stories, Gary became like a manifestation of the things that I was working on in my life (laughs) that somehow would come out and ch- like story form to my child. And I realized this is doing, this is doing something to my psyche. Uh-huh. So I, so I started developing this, like, what is, what's going on here? And I, I, I felt that there was like, this was a vehicle for me to really grapple with the deep questions that I was thinking about. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that's where Hackberry came from. Um, and it's also like the thing I love about squirrels I actually haven't, I do actually love squirrels. They're not really that much of a bane to me. 
they live like kind of right next to humanity, just like dogs mm-hmm. would have. But mm-hmm. wolves turn into dogs, mm-hmm. but squirrels stay feral. They stay wild. <laughs> it's true. They yeah. will never be domesticated. And there's something about that, like, F you of the squirrels. Like, <laughs> I can just, I can eat your stuff, uh-huh. or I can go back to the woods and eat stuff there. I don't care. You can't make me do a damn thing. Like, I love that, <laughs> that kind of like... <laughs> Yeah, just that it, that kind of offensive indifference of squirrels, uh huh, and yeah. their little furry ninja qualities. Like they just jump around, they just do whatever they want. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and their they, their very they existence. Thrive. Yeah, <laughs> their their very existence sort of puts us in our place a little bit too. <laughs> yeah, like they just are a constant reminder of like, don't take yourself so seriously. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I'm well, gonna eat your trash right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm glad his name's not still Gary. Although you know, Gary the squirrel's okay, but Hackberry's you know, it's a, well, it's more epic, really. You know, which it it should be for the story, I'm sure. Well, no, Hackberry just you know, if anyone's had a Hackberry tree, which I do actually have. Mm-hmm. I'm in my shed office right now, and right outside there's a hackberry tree. Hackberry wood is not useful for anything. Uh, hackberry trees tend to spread up by themselves. They're not, there's no groves of hackberries. Mm-hmm. And they, there's these seeds with that have a little bit of flesh that you could eat, mm-hmm. but there's a pit that's too large. So it's generally considered a weed tree with yeah. a tiny seed that's irritating. And so uh-huh. to me, this idea, <laughs> it's the mustard seed analogy. Like great uh-huh. things can come out of a small seed. And so hackberry is considered this useless, mm. um, unimportant, throwaway person in the people in his life, yeah. lives. And so I think it'll connect. I, a lot of kids feel that. They don't yeah. feel like they fit in. And so hackberry as a character starts there. Mm. He's named that because he's considered useless. Mm-hmm. And then he goes on to do great things and important things. And so there's a little bit of that. I mean, I, I'm a sucker for stories like that of like yeah. the, the farmer who ends up being a king type stories. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. and there's, there's some of that with Hackberry. Yeah. Well, and it brings us kind of full circle to how we look at kids and, and children in our culture and, and trying to think a little bit differently about how we're, how we're engaging them and talking to them and um, showing them a lot more respect really um, for who they are and, and what they're kind of bringing to the table. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure we could keep, you know, keep going, but, uh, it's probably a good time to wrap up and we wrap up with two things, uh, going out and going deeper. So going out is an action step that we want to recommend you and I to the audience. Um, going deeper is a resource, a uh, book or a movie, uh, another podcast, something that we're, we're wanting to recommend for folks to go deeper. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll go first. So you have a, a moment to, to think, okay. um, my my going out for this conversation is for people to just ask themselves what they're scared to talk to kids about. <laughs> it might be your own kids, um, or maybe it maybe you don't have kids and um, you you're an aunt or an uncle or you're you know an adult in the life of some kids. But you know we we're all nervous. I think about some things um, at different times what to talk to kids about, and then. Just trying to interrogate that and figure out what that's about and um, or or ways that you can find to to be more open, I guess, to what kids might bring to you. That's scary. That's kind of the reverse of the question, I guess. Um, and and just maybe paying attention to kids. Um, I think I think that's a great practice. Um, now that I'm now that I'm like thinking out loud about my question. I think just paying attention to kids and being mm-hmm. observant and curious about their worlds and what they're up to is is maybe um, what I what I was after. Um, and then my going deeper, I'm, I'm going to recommend again that book, uh, especially for parents, called Unconditional Parenting by Alfie Cohn. Um, I read it. Um, I don't remember how many years ago, and um, was kind of already on this journey of like nonviolent parenting and unschooling and stuff. And it's both really great in terms of like explaining based on research and studies why certain things like uh, punishments and rewards don't work. They don't give you the results that you want as a parent, the the long term goals of kids that um, uh, grow up to have the values that you you probably say you want them to have. Um, 
it actually doesn't work. It backfires. Uh, we get short-term results from a lot of that stuff, but the studies show long-term results are not great. Um, so I love that because it's really based on research and gives you a lot of good understanding of why that is. Um, but then it's also really practical and talks about in this kind of second half implementing like, okay, but what do you do with this? Like, okay, so you're not doing punishment and reward. What does it look like to try and, and parent your kid? Um, in this other way, because that's, you know, to be honest, what you and I and probably, you know, 99% of <laughs> U.S. citizens grew up getting like, this is what parenting is and this is what childhood is. And so trying to undo that is like, you know, in these years of later years of life, when you're a parent and getting older, like it's a lot of work. And so I recommend that book because I think it does a great job of, of giving a lot of good knowledge and then some tools for how to how to do that. Mark, what are your, what's your going out and your going deeper? I think going out, um, <clears throat> and this is just kind of how I'm thinking about my own son that I'll share with others. Just notice ways in which your kid is just different from you mm. and how you can support them in that. What does it look like to support them in an area that really has nothing to do with you? Mm. No mm. vicarious living through them, mm -hmm. no conforming to your expectations. It's just something that doesn't, that just seems to be like the unique part of them. Like, what does mm -hmm. it look like to support them in that? And then going deeper, I already referenced this, but if you haven't read Ursula K. Le Guin's uh, A Wizard of Earthsea, which is the first of a series, you know, read it. You'll realize in the way that uh, J.K. Rowling ripped her off. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's, a, it's a book that, you know, I've read to my son when he was littler. It's it's deep. It, it's one of the deepest books that I've read. And it's mm. what fantasy should be. So I encourage people to read that. It's also a lot of fun. It's just, yeah. I can't praise it enough. She she was yeah. a master of the form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of, of Le Guin. So, oh. um, well, I'm going to put all the, you know, uh, links to everything in the show notes for folks to find you and find uh, A Wolf at the Gate and um, the audiobook that's just come out. Um, any Anything else you want to plug before we sign off? Nope, I think that's it. Like, I, I, I hope people can uh, take can take a look at it and maybe buy it and share it. Um, it's a fun book. One thing I will say about it. <laughs> I, I, when I, the first time I was published was a self-published thing. And then it was picked up by an anarchist publishing company. But mm. during mm. the same month that it was being published by an anarchist publishing company, a conservative Catholic uh, elementary school was doing a <laughs> stage production of it. So it just shows <laughs> wow. like how two very disparate groups of people were engaging the same content in different yeah. ways. Yeah. Uh, that was fun. That was a lot of fun yeah. to have happen at the same time. So check it yeah. out. Well, I mean, you've mentioned, you know, anarchism a few times, and I, I hope to have you back sometime to kind of talk about about that. We mm -hmm. didn't get to t talk about that and some other things that I think would be really great um, to engage in, mm -hmm. uh, things that people are are not, haven't heard before probably and probably aren't aren't talking about or avoiding talking about. Yeah. A lot of those those different things that we touched on that people are might have, perk their ears up so hopefully we can have you back to to go deeper on those areas too but yeah, I, i'm yeah. really thankful for your time and and for um talking to us today and all the work that you're doing mark mm -hmm. thanks so much thanks for having me lucas thanks for listening make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any episodes you can find us on facebook twitter and instagram with the handle at wdtat podcast you can also rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks to Hope Fellowship Mennonite Church for their generous support of the podcast. Also, many thanks to Neil Curran and Infielder for the use of their music. You can find more of their music online at infielder.bandcamp.com. Until next time, keep showing up and keep being brave. What are you gonna do?
Que le vaya bien. Uh, that's not kind of productions podcast.